how can the adapted death cafe in the form of today's round table with the added panel discussion change the experience for participants in the death cafe uh thank you for the question sarah and uh, thank you to the completed life initiative for creating this space and for all of you that came to join us here I'd like to begin, first of all, with just sort of saying how much I've learned <laughs> in preparing for this webinar. Uh, I learned off of the Completed Life Initiative. And also, I did a little more uh, research on the Deaf Cafe model. I'm not going to be reading from the slide. This is, this is also, I'm, I'm just sort of sharing one of my invisible disabilities. I have difficulty following oral conversation <laughs> in a context like this. If I'm in a if I'm in an environment person to person, I can read body language, I can connect in that way. But it's like I have a certain uh, limitation in like an hour long <laughs> with people talking and there's no visual of what's going on. And so I'm just sort of adapting uh, my disability into sort of providing this here so that you know there's something to focus on besides what I'm saying and where it's coming from. And uh, I think it's it's really notable that uh, you know both of the I, I'm going to say both of the founders. Uh, you, I think you've already heard that John Underwood is the one who brought this out in the United Kingdom as kind of a model to to be expanded and so forth, kind of created kind of a brand on this. But it was actually based on the uh, thought of the Swiss sociologist Bernard. Uh, he had a uh, view of expanding this model of conversation about death to sort of a combination of an academic and a community setting. And so pretty much what we have now is the community setting and you have one hero or shiro, sometimes it's a collective, and, and generally they create a nice affinity group and so forth. But uh, Myself, as someone coming from a marginalized community, as a, as a queer non-binary person, uh, I challenge the idea that there's a, such a thing as a safe space. And in fact, when I, when I handle uh, affinity cafes such as this, I talk about creating brave space. And uh, something just to note, and you probably wouldn't notice this, but uh, something that queer folks have in common with African Americans is we do something that's called tone switching. <laughs> it's like when I'm with my folks, my tone is probably a couple of tones higher. It goes a little differently. And the same things happen with African Americans in a certain kind of environment. And so I'm just sort of acknowledging these things. And I think going back to your question of what can the panel do, I think the panel can help create a safe space. Now, I know a lot of people say, okay, we put in our uh, logo or we put out there that, okay, we, we're, we're open to all ethnicities, we're open to all genders and so forth, but that does not create a safe environment per se, because look at, look at what's going on in the country today. And I think that just the fact of what's happening to marginalized peoples, it's kind of like in this country, we were, totally ignorant what was happening to African Americans. You know, it's like if you surveyed sociologically white people's feeling of uh, how far we've gone and equality and equity, that you would say that, well, we've done, um, we've done amazing progress. But if you talk to the African Americans, they say very little change, too slow, too late. And it took the uh, 2020 uh, kind of kind of uprising Black Lives Matter to sort of awaken us, but we're still not really there. We still don't really understand the suffering and the total pain that African Americans have. And I think that's the way it is with many marginalized groups. So I think I think a panel discussion helps before people come into the room and before we discuss that we can open some of these issues and some of the things that people are experiencing in society. You bring up an incredibly important point about um, how we may assume as a society that a, a space may be safe when in fact 
it's not necessarily safe. And I really um, applaud you for introducing the term brave space. Um, so to to bring that a little bit further into the spotlight here today, I'm wondering how do our identities inform the way we intersect with each other in the context of the brave space of talking about dying, death, and when, within our death cafe conversations? This is really the area that I <laughs> sit in and at home in is, you know, I call it the queering of death. And, uh, and I'd just like to also mention that just being in an LGBTQ plus space is not safe, you know, that it, it's not as though everyone <laughs> in marginalized group is already woke and uh, anti-racist and inclusive, you know, that we have sexism and racism uh, in the LGBTQ community that needs to be dealt with and so forth. But I, I think, and, and one of the things that I'm, I'm also a, a, a SAGE uh, National uh, uh, Education Ambassador, is a long title, I have to remember. Uh, and part of what I do is go into hospitals and hospice and usually what I get from people is that, oh, yes, you know, we have to get federal funding. We have there. We don't discriminate. We don't, you know, we're open to everyone and so forth. And so, and, and they're sort of looking at, you know, you or did we do something wrong? Why are you here? <laughs> but then I ask them, okay, well, how are you going, how, how would you handle a, a black trans woman coming in for hospice? And I say, well, we would be open and, but uh, I don't know, what should we do? And I say, well, that's not okay. <laughs> it's like, you really need multicultural competencies. You, have, you need to understand what, you know, so it's like we all die in a very similar way. However, uh, people in the queer community have very different experiences, even just the family. Uh, their family may not be accepting to them. That they're, they're, they may not be out to their family, and they have a chosen family. They may be polyamorous and not monogamous. And all of these factors have a, a bearing upon how uh, death is handled and treated, you know, and we look at how, you know, the, the gender revolution that we've gone through. And, and I'm a sociologist, and it's like, I, you know, forever was teaching the difference between sex and gender. But really, I have to credit Generation Z, <laughs> especially, to really opening the gateway. Because still, in most people's mindset, is a binary mindset. There's only two, you're male or female. So let me know who you are. <laughs> Which one are you, sort of thing. That's, that's the level of mindset that people are and not recognizing that historically, there many cultures had three, three genders. And uh, in the Taoist tradition, they recognize that there are 64 possibilities for the combination of yin and yang. And so it means that, and we notice there, you know, someone who identifies as woman may have a may may be very masculine in certain factors or may be very feminine same thing for men and so the recognition that these are actually different identities that should be should be honored and should be recognized and i think i think coming into the space and again not just assuming that because okay i'm going to be colorblind i'm going to i'm not going to it doesn't matter to me who is here it's kind of an insult to marginalized people that, that you're colorblind because you're not able to forget that if you're living that life. And so I think, I think that having that kind of, kind of multicultural competencies so that we can uh, be able to actually practice, you know, it's like, it's like even, in, even in the LGBTQ community came out with pronouns and especially older people were like, what is this? I don't get it. <laughs> they, them, it's not grammatically correct. If I say they are, then it's kind of like people are expecting a crowd and it's only you. <laughs> but, but actually, you know, you can practice, you can be in groups and you can practice. How do you, how, the first time it's hard. 
the first time probably in meeting another man introduce his husband is like what <laughs> it's it's but we need multicultural competencies so that we're able to handle this and not just feel we'll handle it on the fly because we basically have a good heart and many people do especially in this kind of field but i think finally just to leave with i i think that we need to uh accept the idea that you know we're we're going to have to be retrained uh, in a lot of things if we're really going to be uh, an inclusive and conscious community. <laughs>